introduce you to our next uh, speaker, uh, Tobias Brandt, uh, who will give us a talk about uh, PR Creole, or uh, Creole, uh, a model language for transforming data. Uh, please join me in welcoming Tobias. Hi, thank you Anna, for the introduction. Yeah, hi everyone, I'm Tobias, and more importantly, this is Prequel. So, if you're familiar with um, SQL or SQL, as I'll call it, or Pandas or um, something like Dplyr, then hopefully this will look um, familiar to you um, without even much introduction, but I will take you through the details over the next 30 minutes. Just a little bit of, um, about myself. I've been working with data in finance for about 20 years, initially with MATLAB, yes, that's how old I am, and then with R and um, Python, and lately with uh, DBT and Airflow, and um, a lot of SQL through DBT. Um, the other thing people normally notice about me is my keyboard. I have a very small keyboard, and that's because I'm um, all about ergonomics, and you'll see how that features in, in prequel as well, because we're trying to bring modern ergonomics to SQL. All right, so the outline of my talk is basically four sections. First of all, why um, try and create yet another sort of modern language. Then um, I'll take you through the, the uh, structure of PRQL, or the pipeline relational query language, which I'll call prequel. Then a bit about how you can use prequel today. And hopefully, if you have time, I'll spend a bit of time on some examples. Um, so, one second. Oh, I meant to start my timer. Um, one second. Right. Okay. So, the it all the story started starts last year on January twenty fourth with a post to Hacker News, and I've referenced it for you there. And in theory, that's all the data you should need. You can look up the, the post. It will link to a GitHub repo. You can follow all the discussions that happened since then, and you'll know everything about um, prequel. But um, in this presentation, my goal will be to, obviously to condense all of that into usable information to give you some insights and, in the end, enable you to make a decision about whether you, know, you want to look more into prequel or not. And I think you know, that's uh, an analogy for all, our, um, all the data that our companies and our organizations sit on. We have a lot of data, but what we need is information, insights, and empowering uh, decisions. And the main language that people use for that, uh, that is sort of universal, is SQL or SQL. But um, yeah, the, the post in question, the title was Prequel, a Proposal for a Better SQL, and there's a link to the, the repo. All right, so um, since then, our I, I was drawn to that post and um, kind of got quite intrigued. And it looks like I, I wasn't alone, judging by our GitHub star history. So you can see that the red line is prequel compared to like in blue, we've got um, DBT, um, we've got Dplyr in green, Apache Iceberg, um, Malloy, and Fun SQL in Julia. And I don't put that um, there to uh, like uh, make fun of them or anything. It's just because I, I think it's actually a really great um, query builder but it just hasn't seen the, um, the adoption that we need. But I think we've been very lucky with Prequel that we've had a, a lot of adoption and it seems to really like hit a uh, nerve that how people like to think about data. So that's been very encouraging. And yeah, we hope to, to have to go far with that. So a little bit about uh, SQL. You know, it's, it's kind of the lingua franca of data. Um, you can w use it on databases, uh, data frames like um, Pandas and Polars provide SQL interfaces. The later lake house, houses mostly provide uh, SQL uh, interfaces. And there's even a lot of projects where you can query the state of your operating system with SQL, your Git uh, repositories. So it's really a universal uh, language for data. And the, the key aspects of it um, that I see as key are is that it's relational and declarative. And I'll talk a little bit more about uh, relational on the next slide. But the declarative part is that you specify what data you're looking for, and you give the query engine a lot of freedom to optimize the query, because the query engine has more information uh, than you have. Like, it knows what indices sit on the, on the tables, um, where the data is located, et cetera. And I think that's quite in, in stark contrast to things like pandas, where it's, um, you have an eager execution model, and the 
you know, you have to pull all the data from wherever your cloud data warehouse pull it to the machine where the processing is happening, and then the execution is happening eagerly, so there's no sort of optimization between different steps in a pipeline. But yet, uh, things like pandas are very popular because the flow more closely matches to, I think, how we think about uh, data transformations. But the, yeah, the power of SQL is that we can take the computation to the data. And so we're looking, SQL, um, prequel really tries to marry the two and give you the best of both worlds. All right, so a little bit about uh, relational algebra. I think sometimes people think of relational algebra when they think of SQL. Um, relational algebra is a, so, yeah, an algebra, a set of operations like projections and selections. And the only point I want to make here is that you know, relational algebra exists outside of um, SQL. So just because we like relational algebra, and I believe it's going to be um, eternal, and we can talk about that uh, later um, in the hallway track if you want, um, doesn't mean we have to be stuck with SQL. So what is wrong with SQL? Um, so the one thing is that it's very patched syntax. SQL is like 50 years old, and as we've had more things developed, different things have been um, added to the language. So the, the structure isn't really um, very consistent. So if you look at the select clause in particular, it's heavily overloaded. Sometimes in the select, you'll have a, a sum and then like an aggregation, so it will collapse to one row. Sometimes here, this SQL, the select clause has a window function, so it doesn't modify the number of rows. Um, it's, yeah, it's just, it's not really consistent. And also the syntax is, um, is yeah, it looks like COBOL. So if you look at that little snippet on the bottom right, I mean, that's COBOL. So it really looks like a language from the, the 1970s. And um, just in the previous session, I was in the data engineering track. Ismail made the, had the, produced this slide. And I just took a picture and it says like SQL is so 1970s. And there's um, LLMs to generate SQL, but you know we hope that prequel is a, another alternative that will give you a consistent way to interact with your data. The, one of the big problems with SQL is that it's not really composable. So it is composable in a way, like you can see here, we can have a nested uh, subquery, but then it creates all kinds of problems. Like how do you, as a human, read this query? Where do you start reading? You have to go into the middle and then start reading outwards, and the so it's not really composable like other um, database engines. And where are the libraries of useful SQL queries or SQL um, design patterns? You kind of you have to go to Stack Overflow and look for another solution. Then you have to craft your own query. So there was a tweet uh, recently that I really liked. And she said, you know, SQL queries are the single-use plastics of the coding world. Like for every problem, you have to write uh, a new query and, and reinvent things all over again. And then it's the syntax is not really consistent. So Julia Evans gave a keynote at Strange Loop last month on making hard things easy, and she had a section on SQL. And she was talking about like interaction with coworkers, which they, they come to her and they say, look, I'm trying to look in SQL. And she's like, well, what's difficult um, about SQL? I've been doing it for years. And then she's produced this example query. And you know, this looks straightforward enough, but that's because we've been indoctrinated and had a drum into us. So there's a couple of things here that are very difficult for beginners to grasp. So first of all, the, the clauses all have to be in the right order. You can't simply just say, oh, select so-and-so where this, no, like the where clause has to come after your from clause. And you can't put the from clause first. And you know, like if you want to filter by something after a group by, then you have to use having instead of where. And this clearly is written by a SQL expert, because normally in the select, you would say select owner, and then you'd have number of cats equals count star. And then later you would say having um, number of cats equals two. But no, like that's many dialects won't uh, support that. And some dialects might, but you don't know if it's anyone's guess like what, uh, which dialect um, would have that. And there's no logical flow. So she, in her talk, she sort of talked about the execution order. I don't think that's quite right, because as we said, the query engine can sort of execute things in any order it wants. But it doesn't have a logical flow for the human crafting the query. So her conclusion there was the, the trick is to just tell the story um, chronologically. And that's something we really aim for in with prequel. Then I already alluded to, but um, there are a lot of dialects. So like as it's kind of like everyone, every vendor forked SQL and created their own kind of dialect, and they don't, aren't compatible. So in the past, that maybe wasn't such a problem, because maybe you were a Microsoft house, and you only use SQL Server, or you were an Oracle house. 
um, or we use Postgres. But these days, data analysts, data scientists, machine learning engineers, we need to pull data from all kinds of uh, data warehouses, from Snowflake, BigQuery, Redshift. So we, we can no longer focus on one dialect that we're comfortable with. We have to now try and uh, speak multiple dialects, and that creates a lot of overhead for, for the user in, in like, you know, crafting your queries. So there's a lot of problems. So um, how do we fix them? And so at Prequel, we believe, you know, keep the relation algebra. We think that's key. But design a new set language that has consistent semantics, a design syntax, and that compiles to SQL because SQL is um, spoken everywhere. So we use, we use SQL kind of like a, a JVM or an LLVM, like an execution platform. Now, a lot of people say, Sorry, libraries? Yeah. Um, yeah, well, I'll come to that a little bit um, later, later on, like what we've got source for libraries. So people say, you know, SQL will never die. You know, SQL is the king. So there's you know, this quote from, from The Wire, you come at the king, you best not miss. So we are aware of that, but we're going to give it a try anyway. So coming back to my example question um, created from before, the first thing about this, the P in prequel stands for pipeline. So you can think of this as a, a pipeline or like a streaming data flow. You start with a data source at the top, and then you stream the data through a number of logical um, transformations. So it's not, uh, not uh, execution order could be different, but logically we're streaming from top, top to bottom. And we have two pipeline characters. You can either use a, the Unix pipe symbol, or we can use the new lines are taking the approach like Python that significant white space. So a new line is equivalent to a, a pipe a symbol, so which creates this nice flow that you know, each transformation is on a new line, and we always have the active transform on the left-hand side. So you can quickly scan your query and kind of see what are all the transformations that are happening in this query. Um, yeah, so the next thing is that each line is that there are transforms, and clauses. So you can cut this pipeline at any level and you have a valid transform. Whereas if you try to like interactively debug some SQL, if you comment out one line, suddenly like the thing is inconsistent, etc. Whereas here you can cut and paste and each um, selection of lines is a, a, a valid um, pipeline. And it also makes it easy to things like just you can just comment out a line and see what effect that has on your query. Then each of the uh, language constructs is orthogonal. So that's something we really strive for. So that means, for example, the group um, clause or transform that we've got there, it takes another pipeline as an argument. And basically, group splits your data set into, partitions your data set into different groups. And then on that group, you can apply a pipeline like any other pipeline. And you'll see some examples of that later on. And um, yeah, these. Because this orthogonality, we've got a number of invariants that holds for each of the different transforms. So a select it will never change the number of rows. A derive only adds columns to your result set. A filter only reduces the number of rows. A group partitions your data set, um, performs a transformation on that um, partition, and then reassembles it again afterwards. Aggregate always uh, reduces your rows to a single row. Um, Window doesn't change the number of rows, and a sort changes the, the order of the rows. So because of the orthogonality, we have a very small footprint of just only 12 language primitives from which we can build up the, everything and produce almost like any SQL query um, you need to learn. And obviously, with a small footprint, small language makes it easy to learn and easy to remember. You don't have to constantly go to the documentation to figure out how things work. And, and finally, uh, things are yeah, and, and they're composable. And so, something you might have noticed, for example, we don't have a distinct. So, you know, how would we? Um, how do you go about a distinct? So, you think about what do really you want when you distinct? You kind of want to partition by whatever you want to have distinct, and then take one from that. So, this is how you um, create a distinct in. In prequel, and actually to generate the SQL at the bottom, I ran the, the, the prequel at the top. So that's you know, the top is your prequel input, and at the bottom you get your distinct statement. 
And finally, the, to really, you know, the big powerful feature to get composability is you can define um, functions. So we have a, a kind of um, very ML inspired and have a sort of lambda syntax for, for functions. So at the top, I define a function take smallest, which takes two parameters, n, and a, a table as a second parameter. And it's perhaps a bit of an odd choice, but you'll see that our functions always take the relation as the second parameter. And that is to enable carrying, because we follow a, function, a functional programming model. So in, in order to allow carrying of the earlier parameters, um, then we pipe in the, the relation, the source data, always as the final parameter. Let's see, we define a function that takes a table, sorts it um, by bytes. This is for a particular a data set of um, music tracks on albums, and then takes the, the first n. So we can look at the, the, the query at the bottom. We'll produce the 10 smallest uh, tracks with the smallest MP3. So yeah. <laughs> right. Well, um, yeah. I mean, it's great. You're anticipating a lot of the, the, the points, so which is great. I will come to that uh, right at the end on the type system. You're going to have to um, be a little bit patient on that. Um, so you know, this produces the following um, SQL query. Um, that's not very complicated. But now the power comes on the next slide to say now, let's say you want to find the smallest track on each, um, on each album. And here I mean not just the, the size of the smallest track, but what is actually the full row, um, all the columns of the smallest track. And it's because of the orthogonality, it's very simple. We do the group to partition the data set, and we then call the take smallest function on each partition. Now, a challenge to you is who can produce a, um, a SQL query to produce the, the same. And it, while it's, it's not impossible, it's also not uh, straight forward. So I'll buy a beer to the first person to show me a valid SQL query after the talk um, for this. And yeah, this is a, quite a common question on, on Stack Overflow of how to do this in, in SQL, which is kind of it's quite a nice showcase for us that it makes it very simple in prequel. All right, so the other things, as I mentioned, ergonomics. So we care a lot about ergonomics. So we've got a lot of um, small little features, sometimes called micro features. So on the first line for age there, you can have a consistent syntax for date literals. They're not sort of cast as strings. Um, we have F strings like in Python. So you can build up complex strings by including fields in a string and it will um, translate that into um, various string concatenation operators depending on what dialect you're targeting. The double question mark is a null coalesce operator. So when you have a, a null, you can easily kind of replace it with that. As I mentioned, you can easily comment out lines. And we also just allow um, underscores in large numbers, so you can make the numbers readable. And we allow trailing commas, um, so that you can easily move rows around um, co and uh, comment them out. So again, not uh, amazing features, but just sorely lacking from SQL. The other thing about, one of the things we care about is that prequel is interactive, so we want a fast kind of development cycle. And, and so as a result, you know, we don't connect to the database at the moment. We kind of infer the types based on um, what, and what the columns on what has been given to the compiler, and it fails early. It works very well for us, but there are cases where obviously it would be great to have access to the database schema, and you'll see on the roadmap at the end you know, that we are um, looking at that. Um, all right, so kind of that was a whirlwind tour of, of prequel. So now where can you use prequel today? So the easiest is in our um, JavaScript playground. So if you go to the link uh, above, you can you'll get a um, yeah this playground where on the left hand side here you can put in your prequel. On the right hand side, it um, shows you on every keystroke the compiled um, the SQL, and it also has a, a DuckDB a Wasm version running in there. So you can put in small data sets and like look at the results. Um, data and transform it and see whether it does what you kind of uh, want it to do. Next, we've got some two databases that have already added native prequel support. So in DuckDB, you can install an extension, and in ClickHouse, it, it also supports prequel. So you don't even have to go via SQL. You can um, natively use prequel in, in those two analytical tools already, which is, yeah, I think it's really, we're really excited about that. That's great. 
We've got a VS Code extension that you can install from the, the store. And you know, if you work in VS Code, on the left-hand side, you have your prequel and inspect the compiled SQL on your right-hand side. And then we've got a, a growing list of language bindings to Python, R, JavaScript, um, Elixir, and you know, people are adding more all the time. OK, we're making good time. So we actually have some time to go through the examples. Um, this is just a blurb of the, if you go to the playground, this is the first example, which is similar to what I've showed before with the invoices. So since this is a fintech track, you know, so that's kind of like a, a, a finance uh, based one. And it's heavily commented, so you can, you know, should be able to learn quite a lot of, of prequel just from, from that example. And then I've also prepared a, a notebook. Okay, first of all, then here's this example. So maybe if we go through this from the top, so, because there's a couple of, quite a lot of subtle things here that I think maybe are worth pointing out. So in the first line, fine, we start with the from invoices, which I think everyone's agreed is how SQL should have been. And, you know, DuckDB, for example, adds that natively even in, in SQL. But then next we have derive, and as I mentioned before, that allows you to derive new columns. So it will just produce a new columns. So we have a, a constant column here of a fee, and then we define another column, income, which is, takes the uh, values in the total common column and minuses the fee. Then um, we have a filter here. We've got a date literal for today, and we minus um, the invoice date, which is another column, and that automatically generates the correct um, code for you know, doing the date functions, which is always kind of pain between different versions. And then we can look at you know, when is that less than 365 to find all invoices from the last year. We group by the customer ID and then aggregate the, by summing the income. So our function syntax is sort of ML inspired that like you don't need parentheses or anything. If you have a lot of arguments, you sometimes need to put parentheses around the, the function invocation to demarcate where um, function is. And as I mentioned before, aggregate will always produce a single row. So this will produce a single row per, per customer ID. Next, we can filter then by this total income that we've just computed. And this is the first, you know, also noteworthy thing to to SQL, whereas the first filter was on the raw data translated into a where statement. This filter here, because it's based on the grouped amount, will go into create a having um, clause. So again, with prequel, you don't have to worry about that. You can just work with your pipeline, and the compiler will figure out what it needs to do under the hood. We can then sort by the total income decreasing. We've got nice economics there that just the minus before will do descending. Um, in descending order, takes the first two elements. Um, so we've got the the customers the, with the, the ten cu customers with the largest um, total incomes. Now we add a join and a left uh, a left join here with the side left, and on the right hand side is the join condition. And then we've got a little shortcut with the equal equals operator. That's if the field is present in both tables then you can just specify it like that um, just to save you some, some typing. But you can also kind of um, give a longer, uh, longer join. Then we derive a name with the you know, it was a concatenation of the first name and the last name. And finally, we, we um, work out that we want a list of the customer and the total income. But since we did a left join, you know, we could have introduced some, some nulls in this join. So we put in the null coalesce operator to say that if, if the name is null, then um, we'll put in unknown. <laughs> no, it's, um, so I haven't looked into deal. We can add some more um, utility functions. No, valid, uh, good, good point. Um, right. Yeah. Uh, the table is the, the all the pipeline until that point. So you join in. Yeah, the invoice. So it's whatever. Yeah, so you're joining that against the C equals customer, the customer's table. So we've got an invoice. No, so yeah, so this, the, the left part of the join is the pipe, the result of this pipeline, which is like a complicated query. And then the right part is you're joining on the customer name. So here we're finding the the invoices with the 10 largest customer totals. And now we're just joining on the customers table to get the names because we want to display on the final. We don't want to just display the custom ID. We want to actually display the name. Um, so that's just so, part of the syntax of joining. 
Yes, and the, the side is because it's a positional, it's a keyword argument, you can leave that out. If you just want an inner join, you don't have to say side left, you can leave it out. Um, yeah. So C is the alias, so our aliases go on the left-hand side. So C equals custom means that we're aliasing that table with customers. So that gets translated to join, left join customers as C. When I say C not person, is C from, you know, below that point, C like kind of column going to like void? Um, no, so, yeah, let's chat. The, the name resolution is a bit of a, a tricky issue, and I think something that still needs... Um, more work, but no, it just refer refers to that table. Um, yeah. The, yeah, I, I could have assigned one, but there was no need because at, at, until that, at, at that point, there's no ambiguity because we're only working with one table. And in order to fit things on my slide, I didn't have to, um, I had to alias it as C, so it would fit in. The same with why at the bottom I call it cust instead of customer, because otherwise it just overflowed my line for the slides. So. <laughs> um, right, so, um, yeah, so here uh, I've got a Python notebook which has got some examples. We, we'll see how, how much we get through them, but we have, we've got a, um, a Python. So I've got three examples here. I've got a, um, some simple moving averages, exponentially weighted moving averages, and some um, graph queries that find the shortest path on, on a graph. Right, so yeah, there's a PyPrequel package. We can pip install, then import it, and then it allows you to you know, prequel compile um, some SQL here. And I, I just hidden the output, but we can show it again. It gives you a simple query. And here I can say that we've got this, um, what do you call it, like metadata. Here you can tell it, target a different dialect. So if you want to target MS SQL, put that in as a statement at the top. And uh, scroll down here. Oops, sorry, where's my mouse? And you see it now produces MS SQL with the top five instead of the, the limit um, clause. Well, since this is a FinTech talk and I work in finance, I've got a stock data example. So yeah, I just download some Google stock data from our data set, so it's an open data set, and install a, a prequel magic for Jupyter. Oh, oh, sorry. Oh, gosh, thanks. Uh, okay, I need to go out of here. Apologies, apologies. Oh, okay, now we're meant to go through here. Okay, just run through it again. Um, pip install py prequel, import it, Python. You can run it here. So this is our default ANSI SQL. And then if you want to target a different dialect, you can specify your dialect. And then for Microsoft SQL Server, you see here it produces different SQL. Now with our stock data, I install a SQL magic, which is a SQL, um, and yeah, this double percent cell magic in Jupyter. And I use a DuckDB database in memory, but you can actually put any um, connection string here that works in SQL Alchemy. And if you look at the output, it produces, this when Jupyter produces a sort of pandas data frame. Now you notice this, this row names here is a bit of a nuisance column. So let's um, filter that out. So I, um, yeah, we've got this um, exclamation mark syntax for excluding columns rather than in including them, which is supported by a few dialects and target by DuckDB in particular, so I need to target uh, that. And oh yeah, the, we're actually leveraging this Droopy SQL library underneath. So the syntax at the top here means take the output data frame and store it in a returns uh, data frame. Um, so if we look at here, this becomes a variable in my space. So here, see this, yeah, it's just produced a pandas data frame, and if you want to just inspect it. You can see it's the same data as here, but with the row names um, column removed. And then let's just do a uh, plot. So you'll see this is uh, returns data over various days, and Google had this particular uh, return here in 2015, where I think that the alphabet announcement where it's quite different to the S&P 500. So this is much better shown if when you look at a price curve over time. Now, if you look, if you know, um, as finance people, um, there's a particular calculation to take returns and to turn them into uh, total return indices, TRIs. It's basically you have to take the return, then you pass it through this uh, lin plus one, x, one plus x function, then you need to sum all the returns that you want, and then you do x minus one again at the end. So here I just define some functions for me that do this, um, and then this compound function, cumulative return, 
And now here I take my stock data and I define a window, an expanding window, which says there's no start. So it takes all the rows since the beginning to the current row. I, in that window, I sort the data by date, ascending, and then I derive two new functions. The SN, I'll take the S&P 500 returns and I pipe them to the, my cumulative return function. And um, yeah, the same for the Google return. And I store the result in this TRI's data here. So now if we look at that, um, there, so I operated on a data frame here and with some simple prequel and I produced these return, the stock prices uh, over time. So if you want to look at the, um, one second, I'll show you the SQL that was produced to, to do that. So I use my prequel compile statement here. And yeah, what it's produced here is you, you can see that um, working from the inside out, it took the S&P 500 return column, applied this lin1 plus function, and then the compiler was smart enough to know that the sum was in a window function, and that is the aggregate operator. So it inserts the, the window function here to do the summing, and then afterwards does the x minus 1 to the result of that. So, I mean, for me, this example is quite a, a powerful um, example because you're doing that in, in, in SQL yourself um, requires quite a lot of uh, smarts. So, um, Right. So next, I've got a, a moving average example. So, so here I take my, now I take my total return indices and I look at the last 20 rows, so from minus 19 to the current row. Again, I sort by date, and now I just want to take an average of, the, of these of price values. And uh, again, I'll plot the output. So I'll see here I've added a 20-day moving average to my um, to my Google uh, total return indices. And again, if you're interested in the SQL for that, you can see this is the SQL that it produced under the hood that it ran on DuckDB. Now, the, the next example is a little more involved, and, and that is for um, at exponentially weighted moving averages. Now, most people think you can't actually do those in, um, in SQL because they're recursive. So here I just first I prepare um, our data set. And then here I define this calc EW um, exp exponentially weighted moving average function with two parameters, either you know, the, um, an alpha or there's an alternative specification using a span value, which is like a number of days equivalent. Now, I don't know if I have um, time to go through the whole example, but the key point is that I can define this function, so you never actually need to understand um, this function of how it works underneath. You can, when you want to use it, you can just call my function. Like so, you can you know download um, a, a module with this function in, and then apply that function to your data sets to produce exponentially weighted uh, moving averages. So I'll come back to it just now, but just to show you first um, what that did. So here now I um, produced a ten-day. Uh, 10 day exponentially weighted uh, moving average. So maybe I'd, I'm quite okay with time. So, um, yeah, the, um, yeah, what that does is at first it does this filtering, it finds your starting row, and then we've got this loop construct, which we, we borrowed the syntax from closure and how they kind of do um, recursion and there. So we, we join on the data set always onto the next day, so from t to t plus one. And then here's the calculation for an exponentially weighted moving average. And I use the coalesce operator so that if you, um, if you specify the alpha parameter, then we'll use that. Otherwise, I fill it in with the span parameter. So you can even have kind of optional parameters kind of in, in that way. Uh, sorry? Yes, so it is. Um, so the fixed point is at the end is basically when normal, no more new rows are produced than the loop terminates, which in this case means you've exhausted the data set. You've reached the end of the time frame. So in your streaming framework, that might not uh, work so well, but in... Uh, <laughs> um, so let's look at the SQL for this. And you see that underneath it um, translates to this recursive CTE that does the, um, the calculation here. Um, all right, let's see. Then, yeah, because the FinTech track, um, here's a balance sheet example. So this is a real um, example from someone that posted on our GitHub. They had this hierarchical balance sheet where like each account tells it what its parent account is. 
and you kind of want to walk the path through the tree to find where certain account, um, accounts are located. So um, what a convenience we offer in, in Prequel is these front text functions where you can have format CSV or format um, JSON. So if you've got some JSON data that you want to work with, you can kind of just paste it in here and then just do some experimentation um, with it quickly. And um, here again, I use the loop construct to create this list subaccounts function. And uh, let's see here. And that will walk down, we'll start the root level um, north of the balance sheet, and then we see, okay, the first subaccount, we've got assets, and we've got equity and liabilities, and it generates the full path here to each of the, um, to each of the accounts. And then it's easy enough because it's a function. Let's say I want to um, look at different ones. I want to look at the subaccounts of the assets. And um, yeah, so here we go. We run assets, or um, let's pick that. If I want to look at the subaccounts of the assets of uh, equity and liabilities, I can run this. So uh, you know, we, we finally get the power of composability with, with functions um, running right in our SQL. And again, we can also inspect the, the SQL that's generated here. So that will, obviously, it, in each function invoc invocation, it generates the, prequel, um, the SQL on that. So we don't have to have a SQL function there. Then we have a, a path query example here that, that was just based on a comment from Julian on the first day. So please don't um, judge my algorithm. It's very simplistic and it just does an enumeration and then finds the shortest one. But um, yeah, here I just define a little um, graph with some edges from your A to B all the way to F with various lengths. And then I do an enumeration here and we can find um, the shortest path here from any particular row. And if you want to change the, the node to different nodes, yeah, you can look at a find path to a different node. And again, the, the, the SQL is here. All right, now I'm going to switch back to the rest of my presentation. Um, right, so, so now it's a little bit about the project. All right, so we're um, Apache 2.0 licensed. Um, it's completely community volunteer driven, um, no corporate association, and we will never monetize. Obviously, to give people faith in that, I attended a number of the um, incubator track sessions about the ASF incubator track, and we might explore that. Um, so, yeah, that's a bit of early days. Um, in terms of our community, uh, we mentioned we've got 8,600 GitHub stars, um, 58 contributors to date, and four committers from which are very geographically diverse, so the USA, Slovenia, South Africa, and Japan. So we're already doing all our development kind of online on, on GitHub or uh, Discord. And in terms of our roadmap, I take the point from Mahai the other day that like tests are um, paramount, so we're going to work on building more um, more tests. Um, uh, the module system, we have a, a basic module system at the moment, um, but yeah, I think it's very kind of experimental at, at the moment. Um, okay, um, so we're working on that. The formalizing the type system, we've also already discussed, started discussions on that, and um, actually meeting with some people next week to discuss that further. Then the database schema, obviously the, the compiler could do a lot more if it had access to the schema um, of the, the tables. So, but we, we don't want to lose this interactivity, so we're working on a me mechanism to like cache it with something like header files. And then also supporting other um, backends. So substrate, obviously like a key one, I think it actually would be quite um, trivial to implement pandas or polars or ibis backends. We just haven't had anyone to sort of had the time to, to put that work in. And then also we're looking forward to your contribution. Obviously it's open source, so you know anything you want to see, just um, come submit a PR. We do merge very easily and a very friendly community. And that's it, yeah, come and check it out. Um, talk to us on Discord or, or GitHub and yeah, ask me any questions. Thank you.